So last week I made a video about my Alfa Romeo 159 sport wagon and I told you how you should get an estate car. Well, turns out I get bored of my cars really quickly and thus this is my new daily driver. It's the 2015 Mercedes-Benz C-Class Coupe, specifically a C220 CDI. And well, it's a car that I never thought I would have, but not because it's bad or expensive, but simply because it was a car that I never really liked. This car stems from the fourth generation C-Class, or rather the W204, but since it's a coupe, it's technically a C204. Diving a little bit into the history of the C-Class, the C-Class was born in the 80s out of the Mercedes-Benz 190E, the baby Benz. And then it evolved into what was called the C-Class officially with the W202 generation. So in a way this is the third generation C-Class, but in another way it's the fourth generation C-Class. I think we should consider the 190E as a proper C-Class and that's why it has chassis number W201, but I digress. This fourth generation C-Class was launched in 2007 as the 2008 model year and it received a restyling for the 2012 model year. All coupes were produced from the 2012 model year onwards, so they all have this restyling. And if we go back to the history of the coupe specifically, we find cars like the Mercedes CLC or the Mercedes-Benz C-Class Sport Coupe. And if you're rushing me a little bit, and if you're putting some pressure on me, I may even say that the lowest trim versions of the Mercedes CLK were actually predecessors of the C-Class Coupe. So what lured me to this Mercedes-Benz C-Class is that it's absolutely bulletproof. And I don't mean that literally, I wouldn't want to be shot in this car, but I mean that its engine and transmission are completely and absolutely reliable. More specifically, this car has the OM651 bi-turbo diesel engine paired to the 7G Tronic transmission. And that is the typical Mercedes engine that can last easily over a million kilometers. On top of that, this is one of the last units produced of this generation of the C-Class. It was built in June 2015. And on one side, that's a drawback because it means there was not that much difference when it came to price between choosing one of these units and one of the cheapest C220D of the 205 generation. But on the other hand, that's a plus because all the problems of the earlier cars are already solved, which makes it even more reliable. And now, I know that for a lot of people, a seven-year-old car may already be ancient, but for the kind of cars that I'm used to owning and driving, this is almost a new car for me. If you want further proof of just how reliable this car is, you only have to see what taxi drivers drive. Now, here in Europe, each individual country has its own specific car that they prefer. You may see a few Volkswagens in Germany, you see a lot of Skodas for some reason here in Spain, and you may see a few Fiats in Italy. But there's one car that you can see all throughout Europe and that is Mercedes-Benz cars with the 220 CDI engine, especially E-classes. Taxi drivers definitely know what's reliable and what isn't, and if they choose it, there's a reason for that. Of course, that means that this car does not have the coolest engine because it's essentially a taxi car in coupe form, but I'm looking for a reliable daily driver. That's all I need. So if you're enjoying the video so far, would you mind subscribing? It's a new channel for me and it's one of the best ways to get YouTube to make it grow. When you subscribe, YouTube recommends my videos to more people. So we can make this channel better. Thank you very much. However, despite all this talk about reliability, I'm still a little bit nervous. You don't know this, but I do have inverse luck when it comes to cars. Whenever I buy a car that people consider reliable, I end up getting all sorts of issues. And whenever I buy a strange car that everybody says, okay, that's gonna break down in like five minutes, it ends up being the most reliable car I've ever had. I had a BMW 750i with a V12 engine and I used that as a daily driver for a long time and I didn't have any major issues. And then I bought a 2011 Audi A3 with the 1.4 turbo engine and the manual gearbox that's not the S-Tronic that breaks down and the manual gearbox broke down. I had to get a completely new gearbox. So I am a little bit worried. And this car specifically, as I mentioned before, has the OM651 bi-turbo diesel engine paired to the 7G Tronic transmission. It's a very boring, traditional seven-speed automatic gearbox. And it sends 170 horsepower to the rear wheels. It's not a very fast car. It's not a sports car. But you know, as a daily driver, it works. This car has got electric folding mirrors, dual zone climate control. I really like the bucket seats with the mixture of leather and cloth. I think they look really well with that blue stitching. 
And I should also mention practicality because both rear seats are actually usable. You can see I'm a fairly tall person and I fit there without any issues. And the panoramic sunroof, which actually opens the first pane of glass, not the second one. The panoramic sunroof actually helps a lot because you don't feel like you're trapped inside the back seat, which is something that happens in other coupes. So you could actually travel with two people in the back without it being an issue. The infotainment system looks really ancient because it is. But anyway, let's take it for a drive and I'll tell you a few more things about the car. I have no idea why that happened. So going over the spec sheet, this car has a bi-turbo diesel engine that puts out 170 horsepower and 400 newton meters of torque and sends them to the rear wheels. You can actually hear the diesel engine a little bit. The parking sensors of this car are absolutely atrocious, and that's something that was very common with Mercedes's of this era. It looks like something you would buy off of China, really. It's the worst quality parking sensors I've ever seen. These are the same parking sensors that I had in my old 2001 CLK. You have to be constantly turning around when you're doing a lot of maneuvers. The front parking sensors are right there, and the rear parking sensors are back there and they only scream at you when you're very close to an object. Otherwise, it's just visual. Another thing that this car has that I haven't mentioned before is automatic high beams, which means that when you're on a road and there are cars coming your way, it automatically turns off the high beams. You can actually, you know, check the tire pressure, how they're doing. Uh, for some reason, there's more air on my rear left tire. So when it comes to fuel consumption, you can see that um, the average since I bought this car is 6.7 liters every 100 kilometers. That's very high because I've been driving it quite fast, to be honest. Um, I've really been flooring this car and I've driven it into the city a few times. But if you're doing between 100 and 120 kilometers an hour, you'll get about 5 liters every 100 kilometers. This is what that means in UK miles per gallon. I'll show you the most useless feature that this car has. Some cars have automatic parking, that means the car parks itself. That's fairly cool, although in practice it is fairly useless as well because you have to find like humongous parking spaces for it to work. But this car goes a step before that. It doesn't park itself. It just shows you what you need to do to park. So this is how it works. When you're doing below 30 kilometers an hour, that little P on the dash lights up and starts searching for spaces. When it finds a spot, it lights up the little arrow to the right. Now you press OK on the steering wheel, you start driving backwards. I cannot see the dash right now. Now it makes you reverse. <laughs> this is completely useless. <laughs> so when it comes to driving this car, this is as boring as it gets, really. Everything about how this car is set up is not made to go on like twisty turns or go on a track day. It's made to go on highway cruises and the Autobahn. Even in more powerful versions, it's not a car that you're constantly thinking about flooring it when you're driving it. It's more of a car that you plan on taking on long journeys. It's more like a GT. And that's what I was looking for in a car. If you're going for a more sporty car, I recommend that you go with cars from another German brand that specializes in rear wheel drive cars. You know who I'm talking about, BMW, of course. But for long journeys, I'd much rather have a comfortable suspension and a comfortable car. Now let's go on the highway. Let's put this car in sport mode. This car does not have paddle shifters, but you can manually shift the gears with the gear lever. If you'll let me get very picky about this car, there are a few things I don't like. And one of them is the doors. I think proper coupes have to have frameless doors. And this one is the same door that the sedan has. It has a frame. They solved this issue with the following generation. Another thing I will criticize is the interior. This is a 2015 car and the interior looks designed 
in the late 2000s. And that makes sense because this car was originally designed in the late 2000s. It's my fault for getting the last model year of a car instead of the first one of the following generation. But you know, every time I drive this car, I realize just how ancient some things are. Like the parking sensor thing that I was mentioning earlier. One thing I do love about this car is the panoramic sunroof. It makes people sitting in the back row a bit less claustrophobic. And you know, you can actually sit there. The, the rear seats are fairly comfortable. That's one of the best things about this car. So I'm gonna give you a small example of these old archaic technologies that I'm talking about. You see this little black square here? That's not for the keyless entry. This car does not have keyless entry. I actually have to put the key in and I have to press the fob to lock and unlock this car. But what this does, this is an infrared sensor that allows me to close the windows with a key fob. And I can also open them like this. The thing is that if I'm not pointing at this sensor, the car just unlocks, but the windows do not go up and down. That was cool in a 2001 CLK that I used to have. It's not that cool in a 2015 car, just give me keyless entry. This may be very specific to the country that I live in, that is Spain, but one thing that I don't really like about this car, although I, to be honest, I don't care that much, is the image that it presents. Because these cars, specifically the 220 CDIs, are the stereotypical car of someone who's just chasing the badge, who just wants to get into the cheapest way to get a Mercedes coupe that they can. I have no shame in owning this car. I know it's not the coolest car, but who cares? I cannot exaggerate enough the look of sheer disappointment that people give me when they look at this car and they ask me with glossy eyes, what engine is in that car? Thinking that I'll reply like a C350 or a C63, as one guy asked me. Um, and I just reply that it's a base diesel. And as I said, I have no shame in that. It's a comfortable, reliable daily driver. And that's all I want this car for. But, you know, for a lot of people, getting the base diesel means that you're just chasing the badge. All you want to do is be seen in a cool, quote unquote, expensive Mercedes. And in my case, at least, that could not be further away from the truth. But this car has two options that are usually chosen by someone who you know, just wants the status that a Mercedes brings and that's it. The first of those options is the 18 inch wheels, the bigger wheels. Um, and the second of those options is the badge delete. You don't know what trim level, what engine this car has just by looking at the trunk. So on the surface, this car could not be any more different from the Alfa Romeo 159 sport wagon that I used to own. And aside from the cargo space on the previous car that I will miss dearly, there are not that many differences when it comes to the will of either car to be driven through thousands and thousands of kilometers in a reliable, comfortable and economical way. In that way, I would say they're fairly similar and that's what I'm looking for in a daily driver, a car that can do just that, drive. Let me know what you think of this car. Did I make a good purchase? Because I have days when I'm really happy and days when I have a little bit of buyer's remorse. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, don't forget to like it, subscribe and comment for more content on this channel. Until next time.